So uh, this picture uh, should be one that you've seen at least a few times this last week. This is the famous uh, skull portrait of Matthew, uh, which was just south uh, and east of Cuba when the great storm was coming through the, the uh, Caribbean area. So the great, the, the song that I kept, kept replaying in my mind was, should we stay or should we go, you know, that old one. And so uh, I, then I read the Florida Govern Governor uh, Scott said, this storm will kill you. Of course, the president was very firm about such things as well. So I texted my friend Tommy in Boca Raton. Tommy is the senior pastor at Spanish River uh, PCA church down there, actually the PCA church, one of them that helped uh, establish this particular church. And this was his response, hurricane party. <laughs> now, I suppose only if you live in Florida you, do you get stuff like that. But the point, of course, to all of this is that uh, to the Floridian, there is a different kind of wisdom afoot than there might be otherwise. For those of us who live in landlocked Indiana, uh, we are not concerned so much with hurricanes as with tornadoes. There are all kinds of other issues. Quite frankly, I can't imagine any of us saying tornado party. Thank you very much. Uh, hurricane party, this is, uh, you know, the Floridian point of view. Uh, thankfully, the storm kind of bounced 10 miles to the uh, east of the coastline and uh, was not nearly as horrific as it could have been. Uh, certainly a great deal of damage and certainly uh, the difficulty of loss of life as well as property. But this is what we're after. We're after wisdom, and we're after as much wisdom as we can possibly get in this life. And so our interest is looking everywhere for that wisdom. Wherever the wisdom can be found, uh, we're anxious to get a hold of it. Last week we talked about this, the idea that wisdom literally means order, and in ancient and modern worlds it means exactly the same thing. We're looking for a coherent view of life and things that makes sure everything holds together. There's a creational sustaining order. We are, of course, understanding that that wisdom means order in our life, and the reason why Proverbs is still applicable today is because nothing has changed. The one who is still in charge, uh, was in charge, is in charge, and will always be in charge, and that's the reason why we like all things to fit together. We actually like order in life. We're interested in consistency and coherence in all of life. What I end up seeing uh, rather uh, more often, however, is that we have a, uh, an Americanized Christianity where we begin to think that there's a duality to the universe, that somehow th some things are secular and some things are sacred. Nothing could, of course, be further from the truth. From a Hebraic Christian mindset, we are interested in the warp and woof of life, that is, the vertical horizontal threads that make fabric. All of us are actually representing that today. Uh, we actually believe in the coherence of life, and so that kind of thing uh, sets us apart as Christian thinkers. We believe that the source of this life and this wisdom is the personal, eternal, triune creator of the universe. So we make sure that we highlight those kinds of teachings when we think about this. And of course, by Jesus, by him, are all things held together. This is the essence of what it means to actually have this warp and woof view of life and things, that all things are coherent and consistent, stable and structured, they fit together, and we are not separating things out into categories, but we are seeing all things under the Lordship of Christ. So there are basically three things that I want to communicate today about the book of Proverbs, handouts around the tables if you're so inclined. But the idea behind Proverbs, I'm going back to some things we've said before to kind of flesh these out a little bit further. Always remember the purpose of the book. The very first thing I want to say this morning is the purpose of the book. Remember that the word Proverbs literally means reflection. It actually comes from an ancient language verb, from the Akkadian language, uh, which literally means looking at yourself in the mirror. So when we're reading the book of Proverbs, we're actually looking at ourselves in the mirror. And what we've suggested there is that we bear responsibility to God and man. So one of the things that we've said rather consistently from the beginning is that this uh, relationship that we have is not simply a supernatural relationship. It's not simply a, a vertical relationship, but this relationship is also horizontal. Now, this horizontal relationship takes place in lots of different ways. 
I've just mentioned three here, a sociological, me with others, a psychological, me with myself, and then a creational, me with creation. So I bear responsibility for the creation that God's given me. I bear responsibility for myself, my understanding of who I am. I bear responsibility for my neighbor and my fellow man. These are things that were actually embedded within creation, and so the creation order, the wisdom emphasis, is that the natural always depends on the supernatural. So, let's give some examples of these things as we go through this morning, and here's just one. You've probably heard quite a bit about Generation X, perhaps not as much about Generation Z. Generation Z is 1995 through last year, 2015. And what we're discovering as we research uh, all of these kinds of connections between groups, that is subgroups within uh, the culture, is that these different groups are really after different things. So when you have young people, for instance, that are committed to looking at screens, and they grow up with screens, and the first thing they learn how to do before they talk is swipe. When we are learning or growing up with these young people, we need to begin to understand what is true and what is false about their experience. And what is false about their experience is that somehow a digital virtual world will be fulfilling. Digital virtual worlds are not fulfilling. And so what are young people looking for? They're looking for deep, meaningful relationships. And guess what? Deep, meaningful relationships with whomever might actually show them some care. So it behooves us then, from a Hebraic Christian point of view, to come up alongside those who might actually have great needs. I suggest to you a book that's just come out this last year entitled Why They Stay. They're playing with the word stray, but this is actually based on research of Generation Z. And the whole concept behind this particular book is why are people, why are young people leaving the church? The basic reason why young people leave the church is because they don't have any meaningful, deep relationships with anybody in the church. Amen. So let me just pause here to make this general comment. One of the most important things that older Christians can do is actually provide some of these relationships with younger people for those who don't have personal relationships with other folks. I emphasize this because the only way that we are going to, let's say, in, uh, see a difference in the demographic of our church at Crossroads Community Church, to see a difference in how many youth, how many young people are here, is because we actually manifest an interest in them. Not only does the research teach us this, but Proverbs teaches us this. This is pretty simple stuff. Like I always tell people, this isn't rocket science. You don't have to go to seminary for stuff like this. Amen. This is just stuff that's right there in the book of Proverbs. So, let's talk about these socio sociological relationships. How do we maintain these kinds of things? And who are the kinds of people that we should be? So I'm going to give you uh, an example of what it says in the Atlantic <laughs> Monthly. Now, this is a, actually the cover shot from a 2008 Atlantic Monthly. Uh, is Google making us stupid? Now, Carr, Nicholas Carr, who was the first one to kind of write about these kinds of things, uh, has also written a, a famous book called The Shallows, which he talks about how, what the Internet is doing to our brains. But the bottom line is, he's suggesting to us that our thinking about digital information and looking at screens all the time, what I just mentioned, is problematic for the human mind, and especially even for those who are growing up in this kind of culture. In fact, it's so bad that if you look at a picture like this and you go to any university setting, this is essentially what you're going to be seeing in any amphitheater. The sadness of this is that research tells us over and over and over again what is the best way to learn something? It is literally to, I know, this is going back into the ancient days here, take a pencil or pen and write on paper. How about that? This is marvelous new information we now have. How is it the best way for us to maintain our memory? What's the best way for us to learn is this. Uh, over and over and over again, I could give you all kinds of stats on this. Princeton University just did a research in March 2016 
where it basically said that people who are using uh, laptops in classes, uh, such as at university, uh, their focal point is about two seconds. Well, really, it's 1.5, if you want to cut the hairs on that one. And the basic bottom line is that they're not remembering anything. Try. We could talk about the implications of multitasking and how, how that doesn't even work. Uh, all kinds of things. So when I talk about this, let me just back up to say what I said earlier. We're talking about psychological relationships. This is what Proverbs teaches us. We're also talking about sociological relationships. How does Proverbs teach us about memory, the importance of how we think differently than other people? It's very clear and obvious that the world around us is gaining this kind of wisdom, which is already resident within the pages of Scripture. So, another basic principle of Proverbs. Here it is. Always remember the audience of the book. So, when we hear these words in 1.8, for instance, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, forsake not your mother's teaching. This is right after the first seven verses, which, by the way, we haven't even gotten to yet. We still have to talk about all those words for wisdom. But here it is in 1.8, the very next verse after those first seven that kind of set up the whole book, who is this audience that we are after? Well, the audience is written for the young. It's written for the next generation of leadership. Sons in Hebrew has a broad meaning. It not only refers to biological sonship, it also refers to sociological sonship, leader sonship. So whoever it is into whose life I bear responsibility for pouring myself in a discipleship, mentoring kind of emphasis. So Proverbs was written for, yes, sons and daughters. Yes, it applies in a family context, but it, beyond, it goes beyond the family context. In fact, I'm going to suggest that there's something called contextual guidance for life as children and disciples assume, assume leadership. Here's what I mean by contextual guidance. Wherever you have an impact on somebody's life, that's your context. You now provide guidance for whomever those pe young people are, old people, your neighbors, it doesn't really matter. That's your context. Here's your opportunity for guidance. This is how you're presenting it. This is how you're going to communicate it to others. Whatever the context might be. So let me give you some context. Uh, here's one. The, uh, this is a, a documentary that came out in 2012 called The Other F Word. Now, before you get all rankled and upset by this, understand that the other F word stands for fatherhood. What's really fascinating about this documentary is that punk rock singers, back in the 1990s and early aughts, uh, were anti-authoritarian. So we're talking about Blink-182, uh, we're talking about the Red Hot Chili Peppers, you know, all of those kinds of things. These guys were against the culture. They were against any kind of authority. And that's their basic, that was their basic watchword. We've seen this throughout all generations. We want to change the world. But what happened? Well, the reason why they were the way they are, actually, in the documentary, they actually come out with it. They said, our fathers weren't present. And so they had no authority. They had no kind of context within which to function in a biological relationship. So here they are, left, leaderless. But what did they discover? They found authority necessary and bonding with children. As they began to have children, they found it essential to have this kind of uh, complexity in, within their own lives. And in fact, so much so that they began to say this, maybe the way we change the world is by raising better kids. Gee, isn't this, just, this is just like a mind burst, you know? This is brand new information, right? No, this is right out of Proverbs, 3,000 years ago. This is old stuff. But what's happening in our culture, and you can pick any culture, any time, any different group of people, whatever nation we're talking about, people group, doesn't matter. People find the same kinds of ideas over and over and over again, and they always find their residency within the book of Proverbs. So, here's just one example of a biologic relationship. But let's talk about relationships that go into that contextual guidance I was just mentioning a moment ago. So we use the word discipleship. Our culture uses the word mentorship and coaching. It doesn't really matter. They essentially all mean the same thing. So I want to give you some firsthand examples of some folks 
that I know who are doing this on the front lines. These are all Christian people who are doing fine work within the context in which they work. Uh, just for the sake of knowledge, for those of you who don't know, I have a radio show every Wednesday, and so all of the pictures that you see include me, but these are folks who have been on the radio show, uh, and the point of the show is, is Titus 3, do good, do good, do good. So, here is uh, Tim Olbram, for instance. Tim has been a wrestling coach for decades, still is, uh, up in Fort Wayne. Uh, no, I'm sorry, over in Lafayette, actually. And uh, he is lauded by his, uh, his young wrestlers for making a huge impact on their lives. And every time he's down here in Indy, you know, we text each other, we say, oh, let's meet for lunch, and I hear a new, all these new stories about how this wrestling coach is making a difference in the life of people. Here is Sonia Grywe. Uh, mm -hmm. Sonia is uh, a woman who is actually helping uh, folks who are going into college, figuring out where that money is going to come from. So her coaching is about finding scholarships for college. Tim is a wrestling coach. Sonia deals with how are we going to find money for college. They have certain contexts. It doesn't matter what the context is. Whatever it is, you're going to be a mentor. This is Daniel Pate. Now, Daniel, is actually, he's actually coming to my house today to watch the Colts play. Uh, downstairs in the big screen TV, I promised him wings, so we have to make sure that wings are on the menu. Uh, so Daniel is coming. Uh, Daniel does a great job in terms of his connection to inner city youth, and in particular, he's a chaplain uh, for various football teams uh, in, with inner city teams. So Daniel has his own context. And then here's Dante Cook. Now Dante uh, works with edge mentoring. If you were at the leadership conference at Grace Church this last week on Friday, Dante was there. It is his organization, Edge Mentoring, that put that conference together. 2,000 people were there at Grace Church on Friday, this past Friday. Dante came, uh, shared this last uh, Wednesday because the conference was coming up and we wanted to make sure to promote that. But we talked about mentorship and uh, we had such a great time together. Uh, he said after we were off air, he said, we need to do this again. Let's have our next session as demystifying mentorship. So we're going to do that sometime in January. Doesn't matter your context, whatever your context might be, wonderful stuff there. So, if mentoring, coaching, discipling, discipling is contextual, what should this teach us in our homes, churches, and general culture today? Well, let me give you an example of this. Uh, this is uh, <coughs> Nate Hershey. Nate Hershey has a ministry through uh, Central Indiana Youth for Christ, which is called City Life Wheels. City Life Wheels is a group that is actually going in uh, to the east side, the near east side of Indianapolis. They've just purchased this large building, and uh, for a number of years now, Nate has been discipling young people, young men in particular, about how to fix cars. Nate said 10 years ago, he was on the program, 10 years ago, he didn't know oil from gas. I hyperbole, of course, but nonetheless, he didn't know anything. So he went back to school to do this, and then he spent 10 years doing it, and now he's in ministry uh, bringing in guys like Edgar, who's Mexican-American. We've got Gussie, who's an African-American, and here's uh, Nate, the Euro-American. Here we all are sitting at the table, and I asked these young guys, I said, what's the most important thing to you? Is it, is it that which we see on the outside or that which is on the inside? And both of them in unison said, it's the inside. What Amen. Nate has given to us in terms of personal relationship within the context of fixing cars is huge for us. So if we're talking about a contextual guidance, we're talking about whatever it is you do. It doesn't matter what you do. Find somebody who's interested in that and begin to do the discipleship mentorship thing. That's what Proverbs is all about. The third idea here today that we want to emphasize is that all of this depends upon the supernatural source of order. Now, last week we talked about the fear of the Lord. This week we want to take that a little bit further and expose what does that really mean and how do we begin to apply it in the realities of life. And I want to make two points here today. One is that truth is exclusive. So when you're talking about the fear of the Lord, you're not talking about, well, we can pick and choose whichever Lord we want to have. No, this is a very specific God that we're talking about. The personal, eternal, triune creator of the universe, the Hebrew God, the Christian God, truth is exclusive, not all cultural beliefs are true. 
But the second point is also important, that truth transcends culture. So all cultures contain true truth. Both things are true at the same time. It's exclusive, but it's inclusive. Both things are true. So let's see, how does that actually work out? How do we begin to apply these ideas? For, of course, we have to begin with the question, what's the source of truth and why does it matter? Uh, we're talking about the fear of the Lord. This is obvious at Crossroads Community Church. Uh, we have a certain perspective. Uh, and that perspective is that all things come from the one who has made them, uh, namely the God of the universe. So let's talk about truth as exclusive first. Not all cultural beliefs are true. So here's a diagram for you. Uh, take it for what it's worth. This is uh, what I suggest to my students. Normally when people submit something to you that's not true, they don't come right out with the error. Nobody just says, what I'm going to tell you right now is erroneous, and I want you to listen to me. No, what people normally lead with is a little bit of truth. And so I always give the example of port particle board. Now, you can pick walnut, you can pick black cherry, but everybody knows that stuff isn't walnut and black cherry. Everybody knows there's a veneer. There's a veneer underneath is the particle board. So when we talk about all culture beliefs are not true, it's very important for us to understand that there is truth and there is error and we need to know the difference between them. So I'm going to run through this really quick to highlight this. These are two lenses. So you've got convex lenses. The first lens through which we look is God's truth. So when we're reading the book of Proverbs, we're saying we are wisely discerning whatever it is that we're seeing in the culture. And we see one of two things. Either we see pieces of truth, agreement with God's truth, or we see error, contrary to God's truth. So those are the two things that we end up seeing, and we're looking, of course, through the lens of Scripture first as we examine those truths. This is our responsibility. 1 John 4, 1 says that we bear responsibility to test the spirits. The word test there is very interesting. Uh, it actually comes from the malls of Greece. So they had things called the Agora, which was the mall of the day. And let's say you broke your pot that you cooked in that week. So you had to go to the mall, to the Agora, to uh, find a new pot. Well, the pottery maker that week had been firing his pots. And one of the pots actually sustained a crack in it. Well, what the pottery guy does is he fills that crack with wax and then paints over it. So it makes it look as if the whole thing's intact. But the astute pottery buyer takes the pot and holds it up to the light of the sun, the wax being more translucent, allows the light to come through, and we realize, aha, there's been a crack in the pot this week. All of what I just said to you right there is what it means in the Greek to test the spirits. Amen. You hold up the pot, you hold up the cultural ideas to the sun to expose the error. That's our responsibility. Lots of passages within scripture uh, emphasize this. So let's give an example. Uh, one of those movies that I love to hate, Eat, Pray, Love. Uh, who in the world gets to take a year off from work and then go back to work with the same job after finding herself? I just I can't. I can't figure this out. The emphasis, of course, of this particular film uh, has a great deal of emphasis on love. Uh, the Christian message is subsumed really under a, a Buddhistic uh, point of view, which comes through. And so the question then becomes, what's your definition of happiness? Where does it come from? Ultimately, what's its goal and what's its result? So in this particular film, for instance, uh, very much of a, a self-centered view of, of looking at myself and, and what my needs are instead of what scripture teaches us that we ought to be others centered kinds of people. Sorry, I didn't get that. <laughs> <laughs> that, good that was a perfect segue. Sorry, I didn't get that. Yes, for those of you who didn't hear on the podcast later on, uh, we, we just had a, a cell phone interruption. That's the reason for the laughter. <laughs> Ephesians 2.2, 2. <laughs> but it was great, by the way, it was really good. <laughs> Ephesians 2.2 2 says, At that time you lived in the way in which the spirit that governs this world dictated how you should live. So what Scott was preaching this morning about the spirit, very different than the spirit that you're going to find out as, as they go through, uh, he and David go through and explain Ephesians 
chapter 2, this is what we refer to as the zeitgeist, or the spirit of the age. So the spirit that we're dealing with in our culture is very different than the Holy Spirit, who is going to examine and explain what we think about these ideas. So this zeitgeist, or spirit of the age, is very different. This, uh, just a bit of Greek here, uh, an attitude or disposition reflecting the way in which a person thinks about a matter, a way of thinking, Ephesians 2.2 is best to understand this as the German word zeitgeist or spirit of the age. We're always dealing with the spirit of the age. So there are always cultural truths out there, and we have to show the truths are erroneous. That's our responsibility. So cultural truths, here are a few. Truth is relative, there's no objective standard for it. These are all in your handouts, by the way. Ethics are a preference. No judgment exists as a lifestyle is a matter of choice. Life views are equal. No one group is superior to another. Society constructs reality. There are no timeless truths. And finally, power is control. There is no debate allowed. Whosoever controls the definition, controls the conversation. Uh, I've been telling my students for years. So cultural truths. This is what uh, we are left with or what our culture emphasizes. So here are some truth versus error components. Again, all of these on your handouts. Self versus ourselves, individualism. Power versus weakness, pluralism. Now versus then, presentism. If this world and this life right now is more important, then we're going to focus on it. Works versus truth is pragmatism, just do it. Numbers versus ideas, consumerism. So we see these kinds of truths, these cultural truths, all over the place. And all of them are antithetic to a Christian view of life and things. But I want to also emphasize this, the second point. Yes, truth is exclusive. However, truth transcends culture. So all cultures contain true truth. For example, libraries. I would like to suggest to you that this idea of libraries, we could go back and show the history of actually having uh, very much of a Hebraic Christian influence here. But this is where we could be spending time with people in our culture to highlight those things which are exclusively true. And, you know, there are folks that are doing these kinds of things. This is just an example of this. So I wanted to read to you something from uh, the StoryCorps uh, group that comes on NPR. And this particular story is really a powerful story. In fact, I just ordered the book uh, this morning uh, that this story comes from. And this is a story about uh, Storm Reyes. Listen as I read this story. Working and living in migrant farm workers' fields, the conditions were pretty terrible. This is um, Ms. Reyes speaking. My parents were alcoholics. I was beaten and abused, neglected. I learned to fight with a knife long before I learned how to ride a bicycle. When you're grinding day by day, there's nothing to aspire to except filling your hungry belly. You may walk down the street and see a row of nice, clean houses, but you never ever dream you can live in one. You don't dream. You don't even hope. When I was 12, a bookmobile came to the fields. I thought it was the Baptists because they used to come in a van and give us blankets and food. So I went over and, I went over and peeked in, and it was filled with books. And immediately... I do mean immediately. I stepped back. I wasn't allowed to have books because books are heavy. And when you're traveling all the time, I couldn't move those things. So, of course, I had read in the short periods I was allowed to when I was at school. But I'd never owned a book. Fortunately, the staff member saw me and waved me in. I was nervous. The bookmobile person said, these are books and you can take one home. Just bring it back in two weeks. I'm like, what's the catch? He explained, there's no catch. Then he asked me what I was interested in. Well, the night before, an elder had told us a story about the day that Mount Rainier blew up and the devastation from the volcano. So I told the bookmobile person that I was nervous about the mountain blowing up, and he said, you know, the more you know about something, the less you'll fear it. So here's a book about volcanoes. And then he gave me a book about dinosaurs. I said, oh, that looks neat. So he gave me that book, and a book about a little boy whose family were farmers. And I took them all home, and I devoured them. And I came back in two weeks, and he gave me more books. And that started it. By the time I was 15, I knew there was a world outside the camps. And I believed that I could find a place in it. And I had read about the people like me, and not like me, 
And I had seen how huge the world was, and it gave me courage to leave. And I did. And hope was no longer just a word. Awesome. Now, I don't know about you, but that just sends tingles up and down my spine. So, in a couple of weeks uh, on the show, we're going to have uh, Food for Souls on. Actually, a group that goes to the camps. There are homeless camps around Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. And they go to these homeless camps, and they can't tell me the locations for, fear, for the fear of the individuals who are living there. But we're going to be bringing in these folks who are going to talk about these camps and the kinds of ministries that they're dealing with, with folks who don't have anything, who live in the outskirts of Indianapolis or under the underpasses of Indianapolis. And this is happening in our own city. So when I think about a story like that of Storm Reyes, and I think about the kinds of stories that people are bringing to us, I want to say these things very clearly. Does, do I believe in exclusive truth? Absolutely. But I also believe that exclusive truth is the only truth that brings the inclusivity of the gospel. The exclusivity of the gospel is the only thing that brings inclusivity. If you begin with inclusivity, who's to say then that there's a standard by which we should judge anything? But if you begin with exclusivity of truth, now you can open your doors wide to people. And you can begin to actually disciple and mentor and be that mother and father to that son or daughter, whatever that discipleship guidance context in which you're in. It doesn't matter then. Because you know the exclusive truth. And the exclusive truth is now going to be inclusive to everybody. And so we need to do what Titus says, to find people who are doing good in the culture. Because everybody needs the truth. So... A couple of ideas here about common grace. When I talk about these kinds of things, this is what I mean. The goodness of all creation that profits people. The scriptural emphasis is on God's beneficence and kindness in weather, language, discovery, agriculture, libraries. It doesn't matter if you're changing oil, whatever it is. I've shown this particular slide before. First and foremost, we are human. What are the things that we have in common? It's common grace that allows common truth to establish common law for the common man finding common ground with all. And that's our responsibility as we share this exclusive truth and become inclusive with it. So the story that I told back when I was teaching that whole segment on movies, what was that, three or four years ago now? Or my friend, I was sitting in a sophomore homeroom. <laughs> it's like yesterday I think about this and I just am transported back to that moment. My atheist friend sitting behind me, and he whispers in my ear, how can you believe in something you cannot see? Now, I, I went to a high school that was 2,000 uh, people, 10th through 12th grade, so it was pretty huge people, huge place. But everybody knew me because I kept preaching you know, all the time. <laughs> so that, this was the kind of thing I was getting uh, from my atheist friends. Well, uh, I didn't have a clue. I went to a church that didn't have a clue how to respond to these kinds of things. But along the way, someone introduced me to Francis Schaeffer. And Francis Schaeffer's emphasis on true truth, finding truth wherever you see it, celebrating it when you find it and when you see it, has forever been in, embedded within my thinking and imprinted on my thinking, uh, on my mind. So I'm always in a, in a quest for common grace. I'm looking for anybody, anywhere who's doing good, especially those who are Christians, so that we can actually enliven what it teaches in the book of Proverbs. So... I don't know that we're going to have huge amounts of time here for questions today, but I wanted to highlight these. Notice that I said five, yay, six questions to consider. That's actually um, in the book of Proverbs. There's a way that Proverbs uh, amplifies certain ideas. So you'll, you'll read things like three things, yay, four, or four things, yay, five. Well, that's, I'm just kind of playing off Proverbs this morning. Five, yay, even six questions, because I always give you just five what is the difference between exclusive and cultural truth? So I hope I've given at least a snapshot of that today. Why is the source of it so important? I hope I've explained you can't have inclusivity and first of all, until first you have exclusivity. There's got to be a standard upon which you can then evaluate all of life. How can we discern proverbial wisdom in everyday life? I hope I've given some examples of that going through here today. What is my God-given gift in life and how can I mentor others with it? 
And here's where I'd love for all of us just to pause and consider, what is it that I bring to the table? Maybe the, the thing that is most important to me is reading. Well, maybe you can go down and start reading to little kids at the library. Maybe you're into the whole car thing, and you can start doing that with somebody in your neighborhood. Maybe you're into film. You can focus on those kinds of things. Uh, maybe you just have the gift of helping people, and so uh, you come alongside like some of our brothers and sisters are doing down at School 105, just off 42nd Street. I was down there with the principal and the vice principal of School 105, and they said if it wasn't for the church that is literally located in their backyard, physical building, and the church people participating as agents of help in their school, they just wouldn't get anything done. Because these folks from the church are just giving and giving and giving. And not just stuff, but time and giving themselves. And what is that doing to these folks in the school? It's attracting them to the gospel of Jesus. Amazing how that works. How can I participate within the common grace of culture without submitting to the spirit of the age? This is a constant battle for us. Don't think that you, you've ever won this battle. I think about this all the time. You know, I, as soon as I see myself going off track or thinking the wrong thing, you know, this red light keeps going off in my mind. Well, Echo, you blew it again. You know, you're thinking the wrong stuff. So how can I participate in this without submitting to the zeitgeist? And then finally, how can I participate with the common grace of culture without forgetting that I'm here to live truth before other people? Look, we, we bear the responsibility of two things as Christians. We bear the responsibility of maintaining the truth of what the scriptures teach us. Very clear, very obvious. We're really good at this, aren't we? We're Presbyterians, PCA. We're conservative evangelicals. We really got that thing going on. But if you don't have the other thing going on, looking for ways to live truth before others in a common grace fashion, then we're forgetting the very essence of the Jesus command that I emphasized last week, and that is to love God by loving other people. So when we are finding places to serve in a contextual guidance aspect of living and life, go do that, because then you can share the exclusivity of the truth with others, and you can share the true truth that, is, that only comes from one source, and that is the fear of the Lord, which is the basis for wisdom and knowledge, which is the essence of the book of Proverbs, which is what we ought to be about. Thanks ever so much for being here today. I'm grateful for your time and your attention. Blessings on your week. Mark, there's something that